Throughout human history, one of the most fascinating forms of human mobility is religious pilgrimage. That people travel across great expanses to worship at distant sites is itself remarkable, but that it seems to be a hallmark of human devotional praxis, present across cultures, religions, and the long span of human history, is something rather extraordinary. In this regard, when Muslims set off for the minor and major pilgrimages to Mecca, they join a much larger story of human movement and transformation. They fulfill a primordial call to unlock spiritual gifts via the disruption of one's normal life with travel, the experiencing of hardship and discomfort, and movement through time, space, and even seen and unseen worlds all in order to access unhindered witnessing of divine rigor and divine mercy. In this episode, we turn to how people have made the audacious journey to the holy cities in the Hejaz and explore the journey before the journey in the Hajj caravan, past and present. It's a privilege for me to be joined today by Dr. Yahya Nurgat and Zakia Gangat, Yahya is a historian who focuses on the early modern Ottoman world and who, after recently finishing his PhD in Cambridge, goes on to become a research fellow at Sabancı University in Istanbul. Zakia is the co-founder and operations manager of al Fatiha Learning Academy in Ontario, Canada, and a former graduate from the Cambridge Muslim College Diploma in Contextual Islamic Leadership. Zakia made the Hajj pilgrimage after graduating from the CMC and participated in the pedestrian caravans between the sites in Mecca. But before we hear about travel within the holy cities, I'd first like to talk to Yahya and ask him some questions about the long durée of Muslim travel for the sake of this major pilgrimage. Yahya, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure, especially because of your expertise in this field. So Yahya, I think we can start just by uh, going deep into the expertise and talking a little bit about uh, the history of the Hajj. And can you tell us a little bit about how people have historically traveled to the Hajj? Sure. So I always, when I, when I reflect on this topic, I like to start, you could say at the very beginning, or, or close to the beginning, with uh, Surat al-Hajj. Uh, and we have uh, a really beautiful verse, uh, I think the 27th ver- uh, verse, uh, sorry, of Surat al-Hajj. وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَىٰ كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ So proclaim the pilgrimage to all people, and they'll, they will come to you on foot and on every kind of swift mount, emerging from every deep mountain pass. And I think that suggests and that conjures up something of the kind of uh, large groups of people kind of converging on Mecca uh, once a year, although we know that people are making these journeys all year round, uh, especially nowadays. But it kind of conjures up that image of the mountains surrounding Mecca and people just kind of flowing through uh, the mountain passes and into the city. Uh, so that that is a really, I think, a nice place to reflect on the gathering uh, of, uh, that kind of converges on, on Mecca every year. And then if we kind of fast forward um, and we think about early Islamic history, I think it's it's very early on that there's the idea of the Khalif or, or the ruling sovereign organizing a caravan to the Hajj every year. That idea is born, I think, very early on. And uh, one of the most interesting pieces of material evidence of the Hajj is actually a papyrus from the early 8th century, which is currently um, in Chicago. And it basically shows that the Umayyad Khalif in Damascus is writing to the Muslims of uh, Egypt and saying, whoever wants to make the Hajj, you can meet me at Aqaba, so uh, the the Gulf of Aqaba on the Red Sea. So a really interesting piece of 
early material evidence there which um, suggests that Muslims of uh, Damascus and Cairo are kind of basically meeting in a place and, and going on the Hajj together. And then there's also another really interesting and much more well-known early example, the Darb Zubaydah, of course, uh, named after Zubaydah bin Jafar, who was the wife of Harun al-Rashid. And she sponsored a lot of khayrat, a lot of charitable works on the road from Iraq to the Hejaz. And construction on that road ha had actually begun uh, earlier in the mid eighth century. And this, you know, this great road network, and you can kind of just imagine, you know, ma masses of pilgrims uh, making the journey every year from Iraq to uh, to Mecca and Medina. Not an easy journey by any stretch of the imagination, but the, the journey being facilitated along these long uh, desert roads with reservoirs and cisterns and places to stay, facilitating the journey for these large groups of pilgrims. And actually that same image is something that probably defines road Hajj travel until uh, Road, road Hajj travel uh, becomes defunct in the in the nineteenth century. So, if we were to characterize Hajj travel, you know, um, whether it's taking place from Baghdad and Kufa in the, in the early years, um, and then in the period that I focus on, for example, um, the Ottoman period, uh, when the main uh, Hajj caravans are from Cairo and Damascus. We can kind of conceive of the Hajj journey as a journey through a series of stations or way stations known individually as menzil and collectively as manazil. Uh, and it's a kind of defined journey through these manazil, which take pilgrims from their, uh, from their home to the great departure points. So uh, it's some, uh, sorry, um, Cairo and Damascus, as, as I've just mentioned, and under the Ottomans. Uh, another great departure point is added, which is Uskudar on the Asian shore uh, of the Bosphorus. But Istanbul being a great uh, uh, city where pilgrims collect from from the Balkans and from Anatolia. And then them making this kind of journey through these series of Manazil until they reach the Haramain. So that uh, is a kind of summary of how the Hajj caravan has has kind of looked over time and I think it's fair to say they became more elaborate over time with kind of uh, perhaps the ceremonial surrounding the Hajj caravans were elaborated also the security mechanisms and other mechanisms designed to maintain the security and the safety and the health of the pilgrims were added over time as well I think especially in the Mamluk period uh, the, the Hajj caravan has been described as a town on the move and I think that's a very nice way of describing it and I think the Ottomans really adopt a lot of the those uh, mechanisms that were developed uh, before them and they uh, they adopt them and develop them to uh, n navigate all the challenges of, of traveling across especially that difficult desert terrain between Damascus and Medina so they put in uh, mechanisms uh, to defend against uh, the threat from desert bandits. So that was a, a huge concern. Uh, so, some Bedouin confederations and tribes were often quite hostile to the, to, the, to the pilgrims and they posed a quite significant security threat. Others were actually co-opted and helped to maintain the security of the caravan. And the other big concern was, of course, the availability of water and the Ottomans also invested a lot of uh, a lot of wealth and resor and resources to uh, to develop uh, uh, additional stations on the road from Damascus to Medina, and and each station essentially had a source of water which would would be protected all year round. This image of a town on the move is so powerful. It's it's so profound, really, given our discussion on the theme of gathering. And the, you know, this incredible image I have now of masses of people moving from Baghdad, from Uskodar down toward the Kaaba, um, and how this gathering really began before the gathering uh, in so many ways. And now you've touched on the, the really practical considerations that were a part of this gathering. Can you talk a little bit, Yahya, now about 
some of those practical considerations, the threats that people faced. I mean, some of these considerations exist today, but um, a lot of them are a lot less tangible in the modern HUD. Can you tell us about how people were instructed to make this journey to the HUD and what kinds of practical things they needed to think about and consider on that journey? Sure. So again, uh, since, since I focus mainly on the Ottomans, <laughs> I'll basically start with them. And the first thing I'd, I'd like to mention is that if you think of the journey from Uskudar to Damascus and Damascus being, you know, an important rallying point or departure point for the Hajj, because historically, you know, a very large and important Hajj caravan departed from Damascus. So if you think of the journey from Uskudar to Damascus, it is uh, on average about 37 days uh, plus six days of resting and then Damascus to Medina about 35 days of travel and uh, Mecca, Medina to Mecca Mecca, uh, or, uh, Mecca to Medina that's about another 10 days so it's a very lengthy journey and a pilgrim not all pilgrims live in Uskodar, of course. <laughs> There's also the journey from their own home to, to Uskodar. So it's several months uh, this journey takes. So there's a lot of practical concerns, a lot of planning that ideally, in an ideal world, would, would take place behind this journey. And these are some of the uh, writers that I focused on in my work. So writers who actually enable pilgrims to to take the to undertake the the journey of hajj with a degree of forward planning which it which of course in our time in modernity we're obsessed with planning and uh and the pilgrims you know making this journey of several months were you know even more even more in need of of, of being kind of ready materially spiritually physically for the journey well, one of the most uh, fascinating writers I've come across is a, a writer by the name of uh, Mehmed At-Tanuri. Uh, and he's someone from Kayseri, modern day Turkey. And he wrote a, a, a Hajj guide called Anis al uh, uh, which I, I translate in my work as the Pilgrim's Companion. So pilgrims, plural pilgrims. And what was fascinating about his work is that it probably represents what we'd expect from a Hajj guide that we were to pick up now in in uh, in a, in it or or a, or a travel guide even you know in a in a bookshop today. So it really covers all the bases. So he has medical advice, advice about how to travel, advice about what kind of uh, mount someone should choose or camel. Okay, that's maybe something we wouldn't find in a modern day <laughs> guidebook. Uh, and then, of course, he has the all-important spiritual advice, so uh, and also the ritual advice. So all those kind of different aspects to the Hajj journey, which he covers, and and he's very conscious about that. He says, "I've called this book Anis al Hajjaj," and you know the usual title might be Manasik al Hajj or some variation of Manasik al Hajj. Manasik being the right uh, of Hajj. Uh, but he's gone for Anis al Hajjaj because he's really trying to look after the pilgrim from A to Z, from the first or even before they depart from, from their home until they return. So he, he covers, for example, he has a lot of medicinal advice and he has, you know, he says indigestion is a huge problem for pilgrims, the most common problem. So, you know, here are remedies, you know, for all types of indigestion that you might, you might, uh, um, suffer on on the on the journey without going into too much detail on that. Sure, sure. And then, so he has recipes and remedies, and he has the most practical foods to purchase. You know, where should you buy your ihram from? Apparently, Aleppo is the best place because they have the best quality material. Right. So that, what kind of uh, camel should you rent, or should you rent a camel, or should you buy a camel? So these are. You know, the, the, this is a level of detail that we see in this time, someone writing of the late 16th century. And, and another writer I look at, Murad al-Bendi, he was writing in Cairo, but he was writing uh, in Ottoman Turkish. And he wrote a book, uh, a, a Hajj guide too, in which he talks a great deal about how pilgrims should actually defend themselves from some of the security threats. Uh, and he says, you know, p pilgrims need to help uh the, the administrators of the Hajj to maintain the security of the Hajj caravan because it's such a huge 
gathering. It's impossible, he says, for for the the military traveling with the caravan to to defend all sides and all kind of, I, I would, however you put it, uh, all sides of the caravan. So he wanted pilgrims to take a more active role in the defense uh, of the caravan, to arm themselves, to be not only spiritually alert the whole time, but also to be, also to be, kind of always conscious. He says. Pilgrims nowadays are traveling with back scratches and tobacco pipes. And so that was his kind of very uh, em emotive appeal to pilgrims to to be much more alert and conscious when they're traveling. So th these are some of the some of the lit some of the some examples of the liter literature you might come across uh, of Hajj guides uh, in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, uh, from, from the Ottoman world in any case. Um, and, and you see similar <clears throat> bits of advice from other times and places. When you look at North African literature, you see a lot of practical advice, which isn't surprising because North African pilgrims are undertaking a much lengthier journey. They're being challenged by different terrains and different climates. So again, there you see a lot of interesting practical advice, which really gives you an insight into the practical aspects uh, of the journey. Yeah. Do you, did these guides, you've said that they had, it's a genre that repeats in different parts of the world. And this incredible wealth of practical advice, which of course, as a historian must be just gold dust in understanding the views and concerns of, of the, the every man of the period that you're studying. And I'm also now wondering about the spiritual advice that these guides offered, the, the added layer. So first is this, you know, external, just the motions that one is going through on this journey. And the second is the inner uh, gathering, the inner pilgrimage that's taking place. Can you tell us a little bit about the spiritual advice that these Hajj guides offered and the preparation of the journey at these different stations, as they're called, that would have been taken um, in these different places along the route? So I, I've, I've often reflected on this question as well. And one thing I've noticed is that the practical is, is linked to the spiritual. So there's not necessarily that kind of separation that we might conceive of. That's so interesting so, <laughs> that they're actually together. <laughs> absolutely. And I, th this, is, this isn't something unique to the literature I look at. So the Ottoman Turkish literature from, from, uh, from the 16th century onwards. Because I, I was looking at some of uh, Imam Ghazali's writings and he has a lot of practical advice as well which he links to uh, to the to the spiritual aspect of the Hajj. And actually, if you even think about the Hadith, uh, one of the most famous uh, Hadith about the Hajj, مَنْ حَجَّ وَلَمْ يَرْفُثْ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقْ رَجَعَكَ يَوْمٍ وَلَدَتْهُ أُمُّهُ So that's the, the famous Hadith, which says, whoever doesn't commit rough, rough and fisk will return home after the Hajj, you know, basically cleansed of their sins, like a newborn baby. And when you think about uh, rough and fisk, rough being kind of immoral and indecent behavior, fisk being quarreling and argumentation, ill will, basically bad conduct to one's fellow travelers. So here we're talking about a very long journey to the Hajj. It's kind of easy for us to behave ourselves on an aeroplane and then on a coach. And then, you know, we can get down to business in, in Mecca and Medina. But here it's an extremely lengthy journey in which pilgrims need to be in an ideal world, spiritually and morally, on a higher plane the entire time. And uh, the stakes are very high, as this hadith makes clear, you know, uh, the avoidance of, of uh, immoral and inde indecent behavior and bad conduct is, is kind of intrinsic to a successful Hajj, essentially, Hajj Mabrur. So, and in in that respect, uh, main, you know, maintaining one's health on the journey, you know, keeping oneself safe, all all, all contributes to a, to a journey undertaken, you know, with greater blessing. And the aforementioned uh, writers that I talked about, so Mehmed Tanuri and Murad Al Bandi. Uh, both of them link their, their practical advice to the spiritual. So 
when one of them is saying you should choose this kind of camel, it's not just because that camel looks better or is faster, but he's saying if you travel like this, you're going to be healthy. And if you're healthy, you're going to be able to make sure you keep up with all your prayers. You'll be able to make dhikr on the, on the journey. When you get to Mecca, you're going to be in you know premium and optimum physical condition and you'll be able to perform a really good hajj. And Murad, Murad uh, says, if you travel in too much comfort, you're going to become distracted and that's going to take away from your kind of spiritual state, you know, and uh, luxury is something that's frowned upon. And, and actually Ghazali says, if someone's really attached to their wealth, they should, you know, spend more money on traveling because that's be better for them. You know, so that he, he brings his own um, uh, perspective into it as well. So, so all these practical concerns are linked to the spiritual, uh, which I found really interesting as well. And then, uh, from the uh, from uh, from the other perspective of um, traveling by road and traveling in a large group, what really strikes me is that there are so many collective experiences in that, you know, along that journey. So when you think about <clears throat> pilgrims kind of uh, some of the processions that take place for example in Cairo and Damascus one of the most interesting processions I've read about in Damascus which was taking place in the 16th century was that uh, before leaving the city the pilgrims would as a group uh, proceed to the uh, tomb of uh, uh, the, the famous Syrian Sufi of the 12th century and the person known as a patron saint of Damascus Sheikh Arsalan uh, at Dimashqi, and they have with them the standard of the Prophet wasallam. And then after doing that, they would depart from the city. So these are these are some of the collective experiences uh, that would take place. And also, as the as the pilgrims converge together on uh, Medina, for example, and this is where actually I'm actually going to answer your question. <laughs> I, I I took the long route to to, to the answer, like uh, an like an early modern haji, which we appreciate. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Unfortunately, I couldn't like use use an aeroplane or a steamship. So, the, the reason I've taken this long route is because uh, if you think about uh, coming to Medina, pre modern Medina by road, the first the first thing you see. Uh, some of the landmarks of the city, the the date trees, the, the orchards of, of the city, and then uh, the masjid, the minarets, and you know an extremely high point. You see the the dome of the of the tomb of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So all these landmarks. Now, what do the the contemporary Hajj guides say about them? You know, they they say their advice occurs on basically two levels. You have the zahir, so the outward behavior of a pilgrim and you have the batin so it's uh, the inward behavior of the pilgrim so there's there, there's questions of adab and etiquette you know and writers are really kind of explicit that you know ideally pilgrims will def descend from their mount if they're riding and they proceed on foot uh, and uh, so along with this uh, exterior adab you have uh, Things like ta'zim, and so you could translate as reverence, uh, heba or awe, uh, khushu, and uh, tawadu. So these these kinds of uh, inward states of humility and submissiveness, and also mulahada, so contemplation. So these are these are just some of the words in my work. I kind of plucked out of a group of Hajj guides which I think summarise really nicely how pilgrim writers would ideally, Hajj writers, uh, sorry, should, would ideally like pilgrims to uh, really be present in body and mind as they uh, travel to the Haramain, as they travel to both Mecca and Medina. And it's a, it's a journey which is, you know, really undertaken in close connection to the landmarks and the material and visual and even uh, the oral um, and the the olfactory, you know, the multisensorial aspects of, of the holy cities. And 
those multisensorial aspects of the holy cities kind of come together with the pilgrim's own, you know, uh, bodily behaviors and inward behaviors. And I, I probably mentioned this pro because something of that is lost in the way that we undertake the journey now. Uh, we don't really experience that those physical aspects of the city in the same way and in, in that drawn out way that pre-modern pilgrims did. So I think I've I somewhat answered your question there. No, very thoroughly, <laughs> very thoroughly. I think, you know, this this aspect of the kind of continuity and lack of continuity with with the pre-modern Hajj that we experience. Of course, Hajjis throughout the ages experience surely similar things, but over time, as our route to Hajj has changed, as the gathering places that you've described with such rich texture and vivid colors, um, as they have not or have lost their status as gathering places, now the gathering place is the airport, right? I, I'm assuming, and um, whichever airport you travel from, which I'm sure, like you're saying, has its own charm and its own um, its own internal and external intertwinings as, as it continues. But surely that slowness of the past um, is is a thing is a thing that's lost in the, in the modern age now. Yeah, I agree. There, there's some there's some really interesting uh, connections you can make between the pre-modern and the modern Hajj. And then, of course, there's these really in, interesting differences as well. But the, the Hajj remains something that, that, that can be a very powerful experience, both communally and individually. I don't think that has necessarily changed. I think, of course, uh, the kind of diversity of Hajj as a ritual, its kind of difference from other rituals remains as well. The fact that it's physically demanding is probably still the same. It's fair to say much less physically demanding than it has been in the past. Um, and also it's still what you could say is what you could describe as an exclusive journey. So it's still a very small percentage of Muslims who are able uh, to make uh, the Hajj. So in the UK, you can save up and you can make the Hajj. And it, but in most Muslim countries, you have to uh, enter a system where there's a quota and, you know, there's a there's a lot there's there's more obstacles uh, to making the Hajj in those places. So th that that that's that's a kind of similarity as well. The kind of challenges that that, that are present in making the Hajj, which ultimately endow uh, the Hajj itself with greater meaning. It's not something that's necessarily easy to do financially or physically. I was just reflecting as well on 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 another similarity. It's still Mecca, still a faraway place. You know, it's still. Uh, place that we travel to um, and e even if it if it's a, a journey that doesn't take us very long it's still a journey we make often in the company of of our fellow Muslims uh, and when, if you look at the interviews um, of of uh, returning hajjis or pilgrims they still talk about that togetherness they still talk about forming lifelong uh, friendships and relationships with people that they built up in the tents of Mina and in Arafah and in Muzdalifah and in the hotels. So that that is another in interesting similarity that I always pick up on. Having said that, uh, they could build up even, even more relationships if they were traveling in a tent with this group of pilgrims for like two months on the, on the way to the Haramain. Well, perhaps this very conversation will plant a seed in, in, in all our minds to think about what things we'd like to revive from these ancient caravans and, and perhaps what can be revived and, and renewed in, in our place and time. Yeah, yeah, I Absolutely. thank you so much um, for sharing your insight with us and really for painting such a vivid uh, and clear picture of what this looked like and leaving us with this beautiful image of throngs of people gathering before the gathering and moving together as a town. So thank you so much, Yahya. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Yahya's vivid descriptions of the throngs of people gathering in sites like Damascus and Cairo and then moving together as one 
towards the holy cities of Mecca and Medina may seem like a thing of the past, but Zakia Gangat's experience of a walking hajj during her time in Mecca enables a window into that great hajj caravan even in the 21st century. Zakia performed the hajj nine years ago in 2013, and I asked her to share some of her experiences with us. The year that I went to Hajj, the year that kind of proceeded to it, was a very momentous year for me. I was a student full-time at Cambridge Muslim College, alhamdulillah. Um, and uh, that year was the first year where my husband was working full-time, having settled you know, many of his other commitments. And it was his priority to, um, for us to go to Hajj as soon as we are able to. Um, alhamdulillah, I had a daughter that my mother-in-law took care of and my hajj was really my husband taking me for hajj um, and you know that's that was the year. I would say that year was also important because I was physically very strong. Um, we had a whole year of tai chi that I think I knew in my mind um, I've, I've prepared myself physically for this journey and alhamdulillah, it was a full year of studying, so mentally I felt very much in a right place, in a good place. Um, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, these are things that I reflect on that were significant as part of my experience. And I had a very good understanding of how to do hajj. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, was a big part of that preparation year, alhamdulillah. What kind of gathering within the gathering did you have on your way to Hajj? Did you go with a group? Were you on your own? Were you guys flying solo or were you with others? And what was that like to be together in, in this larger gathering of people? Yeah, a lot of people have really cool stories and experiences about who they went for Hajj with. For me, um, I, what I appreciate so much is it was a tight-knit group. I went to Hajj with my husband, with my older brother and my sister-in-law, Halima. And my younger brother was a resident of uh, Medina, so he joined us and I would say he led us in our little Hajj experience. And we had another um, young boy from UK named Qasim and he joined us that year. So we were a group of youngsters that were together. We were part of a larger group. Um, and al Behesht was probably the tour company. Uh, there were many people there. but. Because much of our experience was uh, not with the group, uh, they're not really significant in my memory as part of my Hajj experience. Hmm. Is that because of the way you all uh, participated in the various rituals? Did you end up doing things differently somehow? Or how was it that you ended up being your own group away from your bigger group, but still in the larger group? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, we did have quite a unique Hajj experience and a very meaningful one. Um, my younger brother had done two Hajj before in which he walked the entire process. And he presented it to us and we were all like, absolutely, inshallah, we'll do this. We also kind of chose that route. We knew that, um, you know, you can do Hajj differently. You can be flown into Jeddah. You can ride from Jeddah to Mecca and you can go from Mecca to Mina to Arafah to Muzdalifah back to Mina. You know, all of those be, can be done through bus transportation and various forms of transportation. But uh, all of us were at that place where in our heart we wanted to do a walking Hajj and we were so grateful that and, and fortunate that we had someone who can kind of lead us through it. That That is a big part of it. Um, and a walking Hajj was considered because Hajj is a pilgrimage. You know, Hajj is like the worship of a lifetime. And I always felt that we are cut short on our Hajj experience because of how convenient uh, things can be made for us. Uh, I, you know, um, one 
when I was living in India, I would see that the village and all the people in your street would come to honor you if you were going for Hajj or Umrah. Or when you were coming back, people would go to the train station to welcome you back. And I just felt like when I would see people uh, in, from the West going, I felt like that experience was really dimmed or not there at all. Almost like you go for Hajj, you have the burden of bringing back gifts and maybe you can make people feel special rather than people coming and honoring you. There's that shift. Um, so going to Hajj, uh, you know, I was grateful that there was the opportunity to be able to walk it, to be able to um, experience it uh, a little bit more intensely. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience, Zakia, and what what was your experience of the mobility between these sites, and how did you experience it differently uh, moving in this ancient way? Uh, you know, Mecca is pretty interesting. It's very ancient and it's so modern. Um, <laughs> and we really have to be mindful of what we're seeking. We really have to be mindful of um, the choices we're making from moment to moment. And that will determine the way in which you experience your Hajj journey uh, or your time in the Blessed Lands. Um, so how did I feel during my Hajj journey? I mean, how to summarize that? Um, I'll probably like maybe just break it down to my senses, you know, um, making the intention, donning the ihram, doing your first uh, umrah, waiting a couple of days and then the hajj began. The day of hajj had an intensity to it. This is it, this is day one. We went uh, to the haram to pray fajr. We left after fajr, we started our walk towards Mina. You know, I heard that it would be intense, but I think we felt very ready and excited actually. Oh, oh we're gonna walk. Um, and as we walked and we continued to walk, we saw the crowd thinning. And uh, you know, there's, there are parallel routes, there are, there's transportation, uh, you know, highways made in which people are being bused constantly, hundreds and hundreds of people. And then you have large pathways, walkways that are built for people that are going to walk. And uh, the walking felt actually very fulfilling. Every step that you're taking, and as you're chanting your talbiya, you feel like you are constantly in worship. And, uh, you know, you're, you recognize you're moving in a direction. And this direction, you're kind of coming closer to something. It's, it's like a quest. And there are these stages and every step is like part of it. And much of it is still unknown. You know, we didn't, act, but because we had, you know, someone that had done it before, we weren't at all anxious. We were just taking moment to moment. And um, so there was the walk. You know, what did I see? You know, so the walk it, itself was like, we fully embraced it. It was, it was actually very beautiful. It was, it was hot. There was vastness around us. Um, there's the intensity of the sun. It's moving as you're moving along. Um, of the walk from Mecca to Mina is like at least 12 to 14 kilometers. And I know our tent was at the border of uh, Mina. So it was quite a long walk. But uh, alhamdulillah, when we reached Mina, we felt, Ya Rabbi, we made it to point B, you know, accept it. Uh, and what I find really beautiful was that first walk was an experience of, we didn't need to fill the time speaking to one another. Everyone was in their little zone bubble. Everyone was reciting the talbiya. Um that was really, you're with a lot of people, You've, you're walking past people, some people are taking breaks, uh, you're walking, you're joining other groups suddenly, you know, you, you realize you've walked with this group for two, three kilometers now already, and then maybe they'll slow down, maybe you'll go forward. Um, but all that time was not difficult to pass, it, it just, it passed really beautifully. And, and in that, you're making dua, and you're conversing with Allah, and your thoughts are just you know, walking itself is so therapeutic. Now imagine when you're walking for Hajj. It just, it fills in very beautifully. And then we reached Mina. Um, and like that, uh, when I was walking and I would look around to me at Mina, uh, I think what I kind of, I felt very grateful for how privileged I saw us as a young group of British Canadian Muslims walking for Hajj. 
Firstly, I felt so grateful that we were walking because everyone in our group was not walking. They were being transported um, and some might have very real reasons. Some just didn't know this was an option. Uh, not everyone had a brother who had done to Hajj before, maybe, you know. So the fact that we were watching, walking felt like such an intense and immense blessing for us. But at the same time, as you're looking around, you could see that we're quite a unique group. We are all young. We're all strong and healthy. And I just felt like my croc slippers stood out <laughs> <laughs> compared to other people's mm. footwear. Mm. And when I look around me, I saw groups of people, um, you know, often very elderly people with younger folks, you know, maybe their children, um, they're, they're supporting them, at, you know, at times when they're walking, sometimes you see someone with an elder on their back. Um, I remember, you know, what really stood out to me is when I saw someone with children and, you know, you have your child on your shoulders, you have your child, younger child on your waist. And I, as a mother who had left her daughter behind in UK, um, I was expecting during my head journey, you know, so of course, when you see children, it just touches the maternal nerve, but you, nobody would choose to do hajj with children without a stroller by choice, you know? So that kind of tells you that, um, it tells a story of the people that are around you that, I mean, I feel grateful for myself to have chosen to do hajj and I'm so grateful for them because I think they've experienced a very beautiful and intense hajj and Allah doesn't uh, overlook those sacrifices. They're rewarded many fold. Um, but you see, you know, that there are people who are doing walking hajjs because that's the only option for them. Right? They would very much um, benefit maybe with some ease, but that's not an option for them. And then the beauty of all the ethnicities that you see passing by you, you see people, you know, of all the colors of different ages, different uh, abilities. Oh, when you see someone who, you know, is crippled in certain ways and then they're walking and really the journey ahead is very long. There's many more kilometers to come today, many more kilometers in the days later. You know, how, how far will you make it? You don't know. So that was really a beautiful experience kind of just to see the people that you're walking with especially as a walking hajj. Um, the sound of the tilbiyah was really magical. Um, and it was such a constant um, companion to us. When we're tired, you can hear the voice kind of dimming down. And then we're trying to build momentum. Someone's going to raise their voice <laughs> and everyone, you start walking faster, you know, it, it had a, it was really beautiful. And labayk is such a special word to me because when I was in India, my teachers would take attendance and we'd say labayk, I'm here. And so it felt like a word where you're constantly telling Allah, I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm, I'm right here with you, for you. I'm here fully, you know, in submission. So that was, you know, um, another experience that was really beautiful during this walking hajj was, I don't think we did thorough planning on all of these hours of walking. How many bottles of water will we need? What snacks will we have when we kind of just went with it? And, uh, we all, thirst is universal, you know, you're out there walking for hours and you're thirsty. And then you come across a truck uh, that the backside is open and there are people just distributing cold drinks, juices, water. And to receive that when you're really feeling thirst is a beautiful thing. To be on the receiving end of someone's generosity and knowing you're never going to remember the face. You won't be able to send a thank you card. Uh, you won't be able to give them recognition for what they've done. Really, your most valuable return is you as a haji will be making dua for them. And that, that makes you kind of honor your state as well at that point, that you're in a blessed state. Your duas are, you know, a very precious thing that you can give in return. Uh, uh, that, that's a beautiful experience, actually. Then you see almost um, the currency in your dua. This is all I have to give. Let me just give it to the best of my ability. Um, and, and to experience that kind of generosity, um, unscripted, you know, you don't know when it's going to come. There's not, there's no map that said, okay, what, two kilometers down, <laughs> you're going to have another generosity point, make it there. You know, <laughs> when it came, it came. And when it came, you know, from the depths of you, you're like, alhamdulillah, that was beautiful. Um, and... 
another experience as part of the walking was really um you're part of a very large group but Allah has accepted each person individually as part of you know someone who said la bake and they're here uh, and there's it's really interesting to be amongst so many people but yet to kind of be individually acknowledged like i don't know how to word that but you're almost you're nothing because you're amongst an ocean of people um, who are you but at the same time no you are a person that Allah chose from amongst millions of others who may have wanted to come or despite there being millions here here you are for hajj i think that's really a very powerful experience uh and um how how do we make sure that we make this journey count and be the best uh you know um recipients of this generosity of this invitation uh, and not return the word that comes to our mind is mahroom you know uh, deprived deprived of all the blessings that Allah has for someone who comes for this journey this life once in a lifetime journey Zakia, I, I can almost, you know, taste the air that you've painted there for us. Um, so full of baraka, really, just full of blessing. I love the idea of unscripted generosity. That's such a beautiful... Do you think that that is... That unscripted generosity is somehow more present in the Hajj or are you more aware of it in the Hajj? Is your consciousness to those things raised? Is is that happening all the time or is the Hajj different somehow? Well, I absolutely feel like you experience it fully in the sacred lands in Hajj um, and also you see yourself uh, with the opportunity to do so as well. Hajj is really such a great teacher. It's almost like a, uh, you know, speaking about generosity, people who will see that you're praying on the ground and will spread their musalla out for you. <laughs> and then they decide to get up and leave and they've left you a gift of the musalla. <laughs> so then the question is, what are you going to do? Well, you look for a beautiful opportunity when you can do the same thing. You see someone who's praying on the ground, you spread the musalla out for them. It's almost like... I don't know, the space in which the kindness is kind of just manifold. And you have to ask yourself, what a perfect training ground. How, how will I exercise my generosity muscle? I mean, I'm, an, I'm on the receiving end so often, right? Um, the generosity of people giving things out. That, that was like a, the generosity in just people the way they look at you. The generosity in um, people sharing their musalla. The generosity in being patient with people, in reaching out and helping people, um, all sorts of in engaging with people when you do in a in a in a in a generous way, um, you know. There's there when you're amongst that many people and you've been touched by someone whose name you don't know, face you don't know. What could you do? You know, to experience that that beautiful gesture. You've seen examples. And uh, I think seeing examples is really powerful. Like when I, you know, when I think of um, something that really stands out to me is from my madrasa experience is how comfortably we always shared food uh, and you never ate by yourself. And Hajj allows people to experience that. To just, just share whatever it is, just share. Everyone is out of their comfort zone. No one has a pantry full that they're walking around with. Share. Zeki, I can't think of a more beautiful and just apt note on which to conclude our talk. Um, but I do always ask every guest that has been on this podcast, if there's anything that I didn't ask you about that you would like to share, any reflection um, that I didn't ask a question directly about that you want would like anyone who listens to this podcast to maybe hear. Yeah, there's one thing that comes to my mind. I feel like Whenever I hear people speak about Hajj, the first thing that we think about is it's so expensive. And I know that's so real. Uh, and it seems to get more and more expensive. But um, what really kind of um, has touched me was um, when I would see my teachers in India, when they would make collective dua and make dua out loud, there would always be dua about visiting Allah's house and uh, invite us to your house. 
And I found that, you know, even more profound after I came back to Canada, because I know that my teacher's salary will never quantify to even, you know, let alone buy the Hajj ticket, never mind any other provision thereafter. Um, and actually, I've seen many of them visit the sacred land since Allah opens a way for them. Um, I find that really, really beautiful. And I think if that's something I can share, which is, you know, make dua to visit uh, the blessed lands and especially people in the West. Um, uh, Allah has been so generous to us. I think we need to learn to prioritize a little bit these noble um, goals, inshallah ta'ala, and you will see the barakats and you know the blessings open to help facilitate that. Uh, we're very much um, uh, taught to plan to the dot. This is one in which really just longing for it, hoping for it, praying for it is the first opening for it, inshallah ta'ala. So the first, if as you know, parting thoughts would be make dua for hajj. Um, the second would be when you are preparing, you know it's your hajj year, even before actually. Hajj is such a beautiful thing to study and learn about, but really study hajj. And I take my sister-in-law Halima as an example. She had a notebook with handful written of notes she had the entire process mapped out. She wasn't confused. And I really appreciated seeing her in comparison to perhaps others that I've spent time with, where people were just so anxious. They weren't sure what's happening. What are they doing next? What am I doing wrong? What should I be saying? So to ask those questions then is really, you've, you've, you've missed the preparation point. Um, and that's really important. Don't go to such a, don't do your once in a lifetime worship without due learning. Uh, so spend a lot of time learning, narrow down, make a dua list, you know, kind of just know in your golden opportunities what you're going to do. Um, that's, that's really, really important. And then the third is if when you go to Hajj, go with a pilgrim mindset and not with a tourist mindset. So expect, like look at it as a quest, look at all of the challenges as part of the design and you know like i said uh, if allah wished um the haram the sari the mina muzdalifa arafa he could have put it all on one block just you know two houses away but they're designed to be at a certain distance and it's meant to kind of um, squeeze you in certain ways and challenge you and channel you in ways um, that's that's part of the design and so go there fully embracing that, being ready for it, inshallah ta'ala. And, uh, um, and hedge itself will teach you. The first couple of days, you might make some mistakes. You might uh, say something you realize oh, I shouldn't have, apologize, fix it during the hedge period. Don't come back home with it. Um, and, and then you'll see yourself, you know, from day one in Mina to the last day in Mina, you'll see, oh, wow, I, I've come a long way. You know, I overlooked that. I was compassionate here. I was kind here. You know, these characters, it's really, Hajj is a great teacher. So let's learn from it, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you, Zakia. Hearing Zakia speak about the unscripted generosity of the Hajj is something I've heard from other Hujjaj. This miraculous attending to others that takes place and forms the backbone of what makes the crowd not just a group, but a whole, with the health of the group dependent upon the health of the individuals. Zakia and Yahya's descriptions of towns on the move are deeply stirring images of the reality of the Quranic verse discussed by Yahya of pilgrims emerging from every mountain pass. That image and the idea of slow movement and progression towards and within the holy sanctuaries, not immediate transportation, but slow and steady transformation, will stay with me as I think about continuities and divergences between pre-modern travelers and ourselves, and what we gain in our time and what we lose, but could potentially revive or renew. 
I want to thank our guests once again for their joining us today. And many thanks to all of you for tuning into this episode of our podcast. Your continued support of Cambridge Muslim College enables us to train the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Please consider making a donation to the college today to ensure we continue this valuable work. And do join me for the next episode where we will delve into the outer and inner meetings of the sacred state required to perform the pilgrimage or the ihram.